Let's start the meeting, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, encounter, a new encounter with a new guest speaker. Uh, we are going to discuss another interesting subject that is at the uh, interface of linguistics and translation or translation studies. And the uh, unit of the crossing road is meaning. Uh, so, um, a translation is uh, a complex construct uh, comprising many layers, many uh, phases, many processes. Likewise, pragmatic meaning is extremely complex with various layers, processes, and, and, and phases. So translating pragmatic meaning uh, requires the translator and the interpreter, and perhaps I would put both of them in the basket of mediator, requires, so translating pragmatic meaning requires the, the mediator of, mean, of meaning uh, to be in a in perpetual quest for contextual cues. Context is yet another complex, complex environment. Complex environment that is making the job of the translator or the interpreter even harder. Uh, so that's because a painstaking work of interpretation and inference is needed not only for or to serve pragmatic purposes and to make the or to establish the pragmatic equivalence between two languages, two cultures, two uh, uh, contexts in a way, but also to construct proper uh, linguistic structures or sentences in the target language. So we are in this area now, and Professor Daoud is going to take us uh, out or out of this crossing, or uh, is going to wage a battle in this crossing in which we can uh, uncover the reality of uh, pragmatic meaning. Uh, translation act or activity and interpreting activity uh, and also the context uh, and, and crossing the bridge the bridge uh, fr from one uh, ground uh, to another it is really complex it is not easy uh, I would like to start by asking a question to Professor Daoud, who uh, is um, a, uh, has a PhD uh, from UCLA in 1991. He's a professor of applied linguistics at the Institut Supérieur des Langues de Tulis, ESLT since 1993. He is an English language teaching specialist with a particular interest in language in education policy and planning, curriculum development, teacher education and language assessment. He has led several curriculum design and textbook writing projects in secondary and higher education. And he has published and presented frequently at the local, regional, and international levels. Professor David has uh, been a freelance, an international freelance uh, interpreter for almost 20 years now, of course, in Tunisia and abroad. My question to you, Professor David, how can you establish that equivalence? How can you uh, search for proper inferences for a proper interpretations. Is translation interpretation? This is to you, uh, Professor Dale. You have the floor. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for, for inviting me to this uh, forum, uh, which I hope will not be too formal tonight. And uh, just before I answer your question, I would like to, uh, to just say that I've been doing this for 20 years, I mean, interpreting. Um, I've been doing it for 20 years. I have not done much written translation. I did some. Uh, even a published book for UNESCO. Uh, I did some um, written translation for academic purposes, not for uh, financial purposes. Uh, other than that, uh, most of my experience is interpreting, uh, simultaneous uh, and consecutive interpreting. So uh, what I will say will apply much more to interpreting rather than translation per se, which I mean, obviously by translation, I mean written, written translation, okay? So when we talk about interpreting, we'll, we mean oral translation, whether it's simultaneous uh, in a booth uh, with the uh, headphones and, and people listening to you in a conference or meeting, do, doing their own thing and you mediating between them or sometimes doing it, doing the mediation consecutively when you are in a face-to-face -face meeting, a small meeting between uh, two officials or two interlocutors and you don't have the equipment and you have to listen to one and then transmit the message and then wait for the other person to answer. That's what we call consecutive interpreting. Okay, so we'll make a difference between simultaneous and consecutive. But the rest of you here probably know all of that. I've seen the program, which is impressive. And as I told uh, Dr. Uh, Hamouda just a while ago, uh, Salhi Hamouda Salhi, uh, you must know more about interpreting and translation than I do from the... Uh, list of conference uh, of, of presentations that you have been uh, attending uh, yesterday, I guess today and tomorrow. Anyway, to answer your question, Hamouda, the whole issue of interpreting is mediation. And uh, you know, I'll start with something that may surprise some of you, but I'll say uh, my personal test of successful mediation is when the, is when the interlocutors for whom you are between whom you're mediating, forget that you are there. If your job is done to a level where they can forget that you're there, that the communication between them is going so directly, so smoothly, then I would say that you have succeeded in uh, mediating between uh, uh, interlocutors, whatever their number. There may be one conference presenter and a number of people listening or people involved in an ongoing discussion. And when you are mediating from one language to the other uh, and vice versa, sometimes uh, you, you have to get to that level where, at least I ambition to get to, I try to get to that level where they really forget that I'm there in the sense that I'll try to mediate and, and try to preserve both the message, the content of the message, which uh, uh, Dr. Salhi just called uh, the meaning, but also the tone. And that's why in my title, I added the word pragmatic when, when I, uh, in the title I said, uh, in the title to, to this presentation here, I proposed the title, um, uh, translation and interpreting skills and linguistic slash pragmatic knowledge. Okay, so to answer the question uh, more briefly now, or to sum up the answer, mediation, in my view, is the your attempt as an interpreter to maximize the transmission of the content between the speaker and the listener without losing anything including the meaning and the tone, okay? Maybe in the questions later, I'll explain more about the meaning and especially the tone because there's a lot of pragmatics in the tone of the translation, okay? So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it does, of course. Okay. So uh, perhaps we can uh, take a first round of questions 
Uh, Can I ask question? a question first? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, please. Okay, I wanted to, to start uh, the whole thing with, with one question from my side uh, about what the, the participants here, I would like you to um, maybe tell, uh, tell us all what your view of language is. What is language to you? Uh, when you learn a language, what do you learn? Just no, a simple question. When answer. you learn a language, what do you learn? Please, can you answer by showing hands? There is a, an icon for hand, uh, I think, in the right corner. And Try I guess to, people they, they know it. Uh, yeah. un yes, sir. And, uh, uh, okay. Salhi, and then we sal Khlifi. Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Dewitt. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, to answer your question, I think that when I learn a language, I learn a culture, a new culture. And uh, basically, I learn a new way of seeing things other than the one that I already have, maybe. All right. Thank you. That's a broad one. Yeah, any more answers? Just a few more. Hello. Are we still connected? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah. Good evening. Hamoud, you are unmuted, Hamoud. Anyway. Um, no, sorry. Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah, uh, Abir Alwi, go ahead. Uh, when we learn uh, when we learn uh, a new language, actually we learn uh, its vocabularies. It's uh, we learn its culture about uh, that uh, the language, the cultures, the differences between our language and their languages, mm -hmm. the synonymous, and uh, we we have a, a whole knowledge about every all what is uh, going thank, on. on the thank you, Asia Bahri. Asia Bahri. Um, good evening. Hi, good evening. So I think when you learn a new language is learning a new uh, means and a new different way to express your needs. Okay. Uh, with Salah Khlifi, if you can hear us. Maybe, maybe one or two more. One or two more, yes. If, if the answers are repetitive. Okay. <laughs> Lisa Saidi and then Taqwa Jandubi. Okay, hello. Hi, hello. hello. So, when learning language, we aside from the vocabulary and grammar, uh, including uh, for vocabulary, including idiom, uh, we learn, as the other person said, we learn the cultural background and the history of that, uh, the country of the, mm -hmm. the language. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, the the use of the language and idioms, vocabulary, and the intonation when speaking, because the intonation is basically um, very connotative, in my opinion. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, uh, thank finally, Taqwa Jandubi. So, as my colleague said, uh, when we learn a new language, we learn a new culture, new lifestyle. As learning a new uh, structures, of different structure of senses, to express our own ideas of us. Thank you. Over to you, Professor David. Okay, thank you very much. It's not the answers I got are not very different from uh, the answers I get from my students. I've been getting from my students for the last, uh, I don't know, so many years. There is always that uh, idea that when we learn a language, we, we focus so much on vocabulary and grammar. I'm glad some people here said culture and history because that broadens our view of language. And that's the view of language that I would like to promote here. Uh, language is not just grammar and vocabulary. Of course, grammar and vocabulary are important. And of course, we cannot speak without words and without sentences, but language is much, much broader than that. And I hope that today, by the end of the session, we'll get a much broader view of language than just that. Because when you are interpreting, you're translating or interpreting, you are obviously dealing with specific vocabulary, and you have to be specific with vocabulary. You have to use the right words and, and the proper context uh, and so on. But you also have to worry about 
the thread of the discourse, the, um, uh, the tone of the speaker, the intended messages, if you are involved in a political discussion or a, or a trade union, with trade unions, for example, you have discussions, sometimes the, the people don't speak as explicitly as you would wish them to speak. And therefore, you have to interpret. That's why we call it interpretation, not translation. You have to really understand what people mean and then transmit or convey that message with that intended meaning to the other side, both in terms of, as I said, content, what they actually mean, but also tone. What I mean by tone is uh, sometimes um, all of us, when we sit before somebody speaking and we're listening, we realize that the person is a specialist or a non-specialist. We realize that the person is confident or not confident. We realize that the person is, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, sure of himself or not. And, and uh, there are a lot of other things that happen in the discourse. We realize whether the person is upset or excited about the idea or just nonchalant about the idea. A lot of that has to be translated somehow, and it has to come through in what you say, in the way you interpret it. So I'll stop at this level and then take questions from you. We have Muhammad uh, Salah Isa. You have the floor. Muhammad Salah. Hello. Yeah. Any other question? Any anyone else? Uh, hello, can you hear me guys? Yes, we do. Yes, yes. Greetings, professor. So I, wa I want just to add a uh, small, quick uh, comment on what he's learning a new language. I'd say it's like having a new whole system built in our brain. Whenever we speak a language, we always, it's like translating. We have some inner thoughts and we communicate these inner thoughts through language. Mm. Uh, for instance, I don't know, let's say, for example, Japanese, they have a whole syntactic structure for their sentences. For instance, always the noun or the pronoun comes at the end of the sentence. So it's like your, your brain is moving from one set to another set. So it's not only about feelings, it's not only about uh, transmitting that message, but also it's about how you transmit that message. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Sure. Wissal? I can see a hand, uh, yes. Uh, Mohammed, uh, it's such a pleasure. Uh, so you somehow paved the way for my question by mentioning uh, somehow slightly pragmatic competence. And so my question has to do with pragmatic failure. So when interpreting uh, for someone, let's say, for instance, uh, Chinese, uh, you know the difference between and so, um, the interpreter may not understand exactly what's meant by what's said. And so, we are in such position. How do we act? What do we do? And, um, you know, especially for beginners, we're still uh, dealing with um, familiar, uh, you know, such, you know, <laughs> issues and so on. And exactly. so, how do, we, how do we act? How do we react? And how to... Especially how to stay faith, uh, how to stay faithful to the to the, uh, to the, right. uh, to the, uh, the utterances, you know, uh, without uh, you know messing up the meaning. And so. right. Yeah, right. excellent. Thank you. Can we take two more questions, uh, Professor David Afef Bujama and Shiraz Manai? Afef, go ahead. Yes, thank you, thank you, professors. So my question is um, how to uh, how to make the task of understanding the intended meaning easier for the translator or the interpreter. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, uh, I think uh, disappeared. Uh, well, Amin, Amin. <laughs> oh, oh, Shiraz, Shiraz. Yes. Shiraz, sorry. Yes, Shiraz, Amin. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're staying as safe as you possibly can. Good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mohammed. So my question, is there, other than pragmatics, a practical method to learn uh, more efficiently a language? 
any in any language uh, possible. And thank you. You? To learn a language more efficiently or to learn to translate more efficiently or interpret yeah, more it makes To a learn the difference. language first and then uh, consequently to translate. Okay. Okay. I mean, All right. Yeah, I have some ideas for that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hi everybody. Thank you. Uh, my, uh, from it, from your question. car. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I know learning a language is crucial for us uh, for the interpreting and translation. My question is, interpreting and translation, who should, uh, who should proceed and precede the other? Um, should we learn translation before interpreting? Should we learn interpreting before translation? Uh, are we, uh, can we be a better interpreters if we, are, we have done translation before? It's just like that sequence, mm. which one can proceed and, 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 mm. and uh, proceed. Thank you. Professor David, can we take one or more, uh, two questions? Okay, fine. Yeah, I know you are a very good uh, note taker. <laughs> so, Ikram Da'asi and then Yusr Salhi. Ikram, go ahead, please. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Professor, for accepting the invitation and being with us today. Uh, my question is, uh, is the pragmatic knowledge the only tool to avoid uh, miscommunication? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. You, sir, Salhi. So, uh, I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, but I'd love to hear an answer either ways. So, uh, in interpreting, uh, I heard that you said, uh, we translate intended meaning to including the tone mm -hmm. and here we're basically translating emotions uh, but the two people can see each other and can see their uh, mm -hmm. facial expressions mm -hmm. so they're basically aware of what the other person is feeling right. uh, on right. a certain level so um, I I'm thinking that it's not really uh, the translator that uh, or, or the uh, burden or the heavy burden here is not on the translator uh, 100%. Mm. Okay, that's a good one. All right, let me answer these. Because they're. Hamouda. Yes, yes, yeah. over let, to let you again. Yes, questions. please go okay. ahead. Um, some of the questions actually converge. There are a couple of questions. I can't remember the names, I'm sorry, but uh, I just took down the, the ideas here. So um, I'll answer to everybody. The, uh, the first one was about uh, how to deal with an unclear message. That is fundamental. That is an excellent question. Uh, oftentimes, people don't speak the way you wish them to speak. Uh, if you are involved, for example, in interpreting for judges, uh, and they are saying things in a certain way, and you may have some knowledge about uh, that discipline, that whole area of practice, but still, if people speak in a certain way, it's not just about the jargon, it's, it's also about the, the way some individuals speak. It's uh, idiosyncratic. Some people are straightforward, clear, they tell you exactly what they are thinking, and some people just go around and around and informally we say they beat around the bush okay so let me say first that people are different so there's no guarantee that you will get a clear message when you are interpreting that's one thing the other thing is um when when you are trying to tr interpret the first thing to do is to understand the other language. So you probably have to be better at the source language, okay? You have to have a very good command of the language you are, of the language you are translating from. If people are speaking in English, your good command of English, your good mastery of English will help you a great deal in understanding the message, okay? So those are the two things. First, first one is people are not always clear when they speak, and you cannot guarantee that. You have no control over that. The other thing is you have to have a good mastery of the language from which you are interpreting or translating, the source language. Okay. The third thing is you have to have uh, to be able to 
get a clear message, you have to have knowledge of the discipline or the area that is being discussed in that particular event, meeting or conference or whatever. The more you know about it, the more it will help you to understand because what that means is really context. And uh, Dr. Saleh mentioned context early on in the opening. Uh, the context will help you understand things. For example, when I'm interpreting in an event and I cannot see the speaker, I'm much more comfortable when I see the speaker because it helps me understand their message better. I can, I'm not a lip reader, but I can see their face and their facial expression helps me, okay? Uh, um, so what do you do when the message is unclear? Well, <laughs> you're in a tough place. It's a, it's a very difficult situation. You are uh, in that uncertain context but you have to rely very much on your knowledge of the field. You have to prepare ahead of time for the event, obviously. They will send you documents. They will send you, obviously, the agenda and a lot of other material that you can read. You can also uh, educate yourself about that discipline or that field or that institution that you are translating for. Uh, before you go to the event. Uh, sometimes they don't send you a lot of material, but whatever you can get from them, insist that they send you material. Also, go to a website. Go to their website. If, you're, if you know from the program you're interpreting for a particular organization or institution, go to their website. See what kind of, of uh, literature they deal with. I mean by literature, any, any publication. I don't mean literary literature. See whatever, whatever, whatever documents you can get from that website. Read through the website. Look at previous events they had that are related to your topic. All of those things will help you uh, develop a, a broader context, which will help you in, uh, then deal with unclear messages. Still, you would still get unclear messages. And let, give you, let me give you concrete examples. I've done a lot of interpreting with our brothers um, in the South, the Libyans. And the way they speak is quite uh, sort of indirect. And uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand what they mean. We all, we're all, we say we are Arabs and everything, but when you are dealing with uh, speakers from the Levant, from Hashem, Al Iraq, and so on, that's one thing. If it's from the Gulf or from Libya or some other parts of the Arab world, it's another. So even understanding them in Arabic, for example, to interpret to English, you get uncertain, uh, unclear messages, and you really have to play by the seat of your pants. You have to take risks then and uh, stick to the context. Um, it doesn't help to ask the person to please <laughs> repeat what they said. Or uh, Sometimes the, uh, also the message is unclear because the technology fails. Sometimes the sound, the, the sound quality is not so good, or there is uh, there are breaks in the sound that you are listening to, and you get an incomplete message, and therefore you have to build it. And that's why I call it tarjama. It's not tarjama; it's ta'wil, because oftentimes you don't get a full message. Oftentimes you don't get a clear message that satisfies your wishes. So you have to manage, you have to manage, you have to first of all be good in the source language, you have to educate yourself, prepare as much as possible before you go to the event, you have to generally educate yourself when you don't, when, even when you're not preparing for an event, read, uh, read business news, uh, watch business news, uh, sports news, fashion, whatever else. Everything can be a subject of, your, of the next event that you may be interpreting at. So you have to be broad-minded. You have to be interested in learning about so many other things. And you never know when that knowledge or that background will help you when you find yourself in, uh, dealing with unclear contexts. Uh, the other question is related. Uh, the task of understanding an unclear message. How do you understand it? How do you, how do you deal with intended meaning? Well, the whole idea is to understand not literally what the person said, but what they want to say to the other person. Let me give you a concrete example, and this is why I focus on pragmatics rather than language per se. 
uh, one time I was interpreting in an event for trade unionists, people in the trade unions, you know, and they were organizing different sectors, trying to recruit people to join the unions. And in one of the meetings, the topic was, not, was about how to unionize or how to organize uh, people who lead administrations, a director, a CEO, uh, chef de service, as we call them here, uh, uh, a deputy director of a, of a, of a department or, or whatever. These people, usually when there is a strike, they are the ones who are telling people not to go on strike. All right. So they're usually the ones who are telling people to actually go back to work. And, and to organize them in a union was a very touchy subject. And the people talking about this were from African unions and North African unions, from Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and the MENA region. And, and the colleague sitting to me was interpreting, and she was just doing literal translation. She was just repeating what the other person was saying in in the other language, obviously, in the target language, and it wasn't going through. And, and, and I tried to help her, and she didn't like it, so I left the booth and let her do her half hour, and then I came back later and did my half hour. And then during the break, she was, kind of, she was very open-minded, so we talked about it, and I said, listen, this guy was talking indirectly. Uh, this was before the revolution in Tunisia, so uh, uh, we know that trade unions are always infiltrated by the police, so they always want to know what, what's going on and so on. So this person who was a manager could not speak freely, so he was speaking in a circular way, in an indirect way about issues involving how to organize these directors and deputy directors and so on in, in, uh, in various administrations. And this lady my colleague said, oh my God, I didn't even realize that. She didn't realize that the person was speaking indirectly to avoid being caught, to avoid being embarrassed, to avoid being, uh, I don't know, questioned or whatever. And therefore, he was speaking in a certain way and his message was really quite, quite unclear. Unless you caught that little trick, you, you, you realize that he was in such a a difficult situation, a sensitive situation. He didn't want to speak clearly, and he had to go along with his, with his, with his way of, of, of speaking. So you had to interpret that as well. And that's what I mean by maybe uh, interpreting and not just substituting words for, for other words in, in the other language. I hope my answer was clear on that. Okay. But that was a concrete example that I, I, I had in my uh, professional life. <clears throat> Uh, somebody also asked a question about the same thing, uh, saying, why do you have to worry about intended message and people's feelings when, when the interlocutors can actually see each other in the room, so they can actually tell what's happening? Well, yeah, facial expressions help, body language helps in understanding, it's very important in communication. But oftentimes it's not sufficient, and sometimes people use, use specific words to indicate certain things and, and uh, to, to, to convey certain meanings. And uh, for example, the more I worked with Libyans after the revolution, uh, drafting their own constitution, developing new, new institutions like banking and uh, the government institutions and so on, I learned so much about their administrative system, their culture, the way they face each other, they're usually very polite. They don't want to be too aggressive when they address people among themselves, among Libyans, okay? And you have to be self-effaced, as it were, as an interpreter. You have to go along with their attitudes and their, their culture of communication, I call it. Their culture of communication, which is different from Tunisian culture or Egyptian culture or whatever. And, and therefore, you have to go along with that and... Uh, in addition to the facial expressions, which they can certainly understand, you have to go along with the with with what they mean, and and context help you helps you. Your experience with that kind of population also helps you a great deal. You learn a lot from working with people from a, a particular language group or a particular nationality, and when you work with them the second or third or fourth time, you find yourself much more uh, comfortable. All right. Um, what is a good way to learn a language efficiently? Well, uh, 
<laughs> my my uh, son-in-law is trying to learn German here now. And I told him, first of all, switch your phone to German. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Get as much exposure to the language as possible. Watch the news in German. Um, read in German. Uh, Educate yourself, get as much as exposure as possible in that language in order to um, help you become more proficient in it. What it will do, and it will do it, and you will do it unconsciously, you won't even realize it, that after a year, six months, a year of that, your vocabulary will just explode. You will develop so much new vocabulary unconsciously so that when it comes to interpreting, you will find a lot of that uh, helpful. And you also develop the, the sense of the, the music of the language and so on. At our level, we almost deal with language at an intuitive level. We don't spend a lot of time analyzing. We don't have time. So we just work with the language. And the more proficient you are, the more, the more comfortable you are as an interpreter. So get your, give yourself as much exposure as possible in the target language. That's the most efficient way to do it. Read, Thank watch you very TV much, and sir. So on. Okay, uh, which comes first, translation or interpreting? Well, whatever, <laughs> depending on on your on your circumstances. I I started doing mo a lot more interpreting than translation. I actually stopped doing translation. I've done a lot of interpreting, and I jumped into it without any translation experience. Okay, I did teach a couple of courses on translation, so I knew the, the ropes a little bit, but uh, I, 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 I was more involved in interpreting first rather than uh, translation. So whatever comes first, um, if you are being trained like this, obviously you will make better interpreters and better translators. But let me con conclude with one thing on this, and it's also uh, something from my experience. I know a lot of colleagues who are excellent translators. Okay, excellent. They have years of experience, but they come to the booth to do interpreting and they just block. They can't do it. Or they bring a lot of dictionaries with them and they don't have time. <laughs> okay, so you have to be aware of that as well. Excellent. Thank time you. For more questions. <laughs> yes, uh, we have take another round. Mai uh, Goma, uh, Safia Ayat Al Jet. And Huawei, I think. So, my Goma first. Hello. Yes. Hi. Yes. Hello. 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 It's my turn. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Go ahead, please. It's yours. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Every hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Mr. Salhi, uh, for this conference. Uh, my question. I have a comment about uh, language, the relation between linguistics and uh, pragmatics and translation. I mean, uh, uh, there, I mean we use uh, pragmatics for translation. We use uh, to learn the language and to use it to translate. That's it. Yes, and the third and the, the uh, I thought when I saw, when I saw the the title, I thought of the conference. I thought it's uh, uh, translation uh, uh, interpreting pragmatically. Mm. Yes, and uh, about the uh, and uh, com talking about the theories of linguistics, I think. Hello. Hello. Hello, yes. can you hear me? Yeah, yes. yeah, go on, go on. Yes, the theories of linguistics, we can use them to uh, in translation, for example, uh, sociolinguistics and psycholinguistics, we can all use them in translation, hmm. in interpretation. Hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay, fine. That's a good comment. Everything, we can use everything in translation because communication is such a complex process. When you are interpreting, you don't have time to process all these things. You are dealing with uh, three processes almost at the, at the same time. You're, you're, you're listening, you're speaking, and while you're speaking, you're listening to new stuff, new information. So you have to deal with that. You've got a memory process going on as well. While you're listening, while you're speaking, you're memorizing what's being said. 
And therefore, there are so many processes in psycholinguistics, uh, is, is your mind working with the language and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, you're interpreting, you're memorizing, you're trying to remember things, you're connecting things with the, with the context and your background knowledge and what was said before and, and so on. Uh, but you're also involving uh, your knowledge of the population that you are dealing with, like I talked about Libyans, for instance. Uh, you're dealing with the subject matter area, the discipline. So all of these things are involved. In, in, when we study these subjects at university or when we teach them, we teach them separately. Okay? And we tend to talk about them separately as well. But in real life, they happen all together. So you, everything is useful. The more you learn about them, the better. Fine. Excellent. So we have Huawei and then Dad Matmati. Huawei. I don't know. She already asked the question, I think. Huawei, okay. Dad she Matmati? Made, she just made the comment. Good evening, uh, sir. Uh, good evening, professor. Uh, my question is, uh, can, can you hear me well? Yes, yes we do, we do. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, sir, to what extent the speaker's knowledge influences the comprehension of, prag uh, of pragmatic inferences? And can you please uh, uh, speak about uh, pragmatic considerations in court interpreting? And thank you. Court interpreting. Yeah. Okay. All right, Hamoud would be better at answering this than me probably, but anyway. <laughs> um, speaker knowledge. Again, like I said earlier, the more you know about the context, the more background knowledge you can develop about the discipline in which you are translating. Let's say you have a conference next week uh, with judges. Okay, or let's say you have a conference uh, next week on the environment or water resources or water management or whatever. You have to go to the website of the organization and get as much information as possible. If you can read anything else about water management, it will be helpful. Uh, so uh, what you say is speaker knowledge, you mean interpreter knowledge because you said speaker knowledge. Yes. You mean the interpreter or the speaker for whom you are interpreting? Uh, the interpreter. The oh, of speaker. course. Yeah, so it's all about background knowledge. It's all about how much context you can help yourself with. The more you know, the broader your context will be, and the more, uh, uh, the more, the more means will be available to you to get through the bottleneck, as it were. You are in a, a very difficult situation. You are in a booth, you are receiving language. People who are involved in the conference as interlocutors, they know they have interpretation, but they're not going to worry so much about you. Very few worry about you. Most of them are involved in uh, are interested in communicating whatever they have to communicate, whether it is an oral presentation or an argument or, or a counter idea or a counter argument or whatever. So, and sometimes they get so excited in the court system. Somebody asked about the courts. In the court system, I was involved once in a, in a, uh, in a situation on uh, discussing uh, human rights in Africa, and the, the room was set up uh, as, a, as a, a simulation court, a simulated courtroom, and there were three judges sitting in the front, and the, the room was split in, in half, and half of the audience were lawyers for the victims, and the other half were lawyers for the state, for the, so they were uh, public prosecutors. And they got involved in this thing, and it went on for two hours, and they forgot about us. I can tell you for sure, they forgot about us. They forgot there was translation. And you know how lawyers start uh, arguing and so on. And they just got so heated. And afterwards in the break, I said, did you really forget about us? They said, yes, <laughs> you have to do. You have to manage in that case. You have to, um, like I said, the more context you have, the more knowledge you have, the more you are familiar with their terminology. Uh, and terminology is problematic because from one country to the other it, it varies. Uh, uh, 
النائب العام في مصر او المدعي المدعي العام المدعي العام وكذا المصطلحات تتغير من وكيل الجمهوريه ذا تيرمينولي اي وكيل الجمهوريه كان ذا تيرمينولوجي فيريز فروم ون كونتري تو انذر سو اي كول ذيم كالتشرز And I'm glad somebody, a number of you, answered the first question I asked with the word culture. Yes, when you are translating in law, you are translating in a culture. When you are translating in a banking system, you are translating in a culture. A culture is a system of communication where people have their own terminology, but they also have their own documents. They have their own way of speaking. They have their own um, uh, decorum even for discourse when you when you attend uh, uh, an event with judges they have a lot of respect for rank higher judges always speak first okay lower judges speak next okay so you have to you 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 become aware of that as well so you have to learn as much of, as possible about about that the the event that's forthcoming that you will be working in to in order to handle yourself pretty well uh, the more context you have the more education you have the more background you have the easier your job will be but it will always be difficult i always feel after 20 years of interpreting that i'm always hanging by a thread and if i let go if i panic it will all fizzle out really so it's always a new challenge and if you start thinking that you've done it and you're good then you stop learning and that's dangerous for you you always keep in mind that you'll always learn you'll always be faced with new situations you'll always come to uh, there are times where a word escapes you there's one particular word that you want to use and it just doesn't come up for some reason okay so there's all kinds of unpredictable um, events that happen but the more context they have uh, the more experience you have better you will be okay excellent excellent afif bujama go ahead please yes thank you so in the same sense i wanted to ask is it better to specialize in a certain field of uh, interpreting like for example you translate uh, legal um, le- in the legal field or or in the economic field and mm-hmm. so on mm-hmm. or is it okay to to translate everything not everything i mean okay there's a theoretical answer to that <laughs> and there's a practical one the practical one is you get what you find okay if you are uh, waiting for a translation job and um, you want to make some money and you have time on your hands you will accept whatever whatever comes your way but uh, if you want to be really professional in your job you will find yourself uh, willy-nilly as it were specializing in certain areas maybe not just one but two or three to be realistic okay because if you specialize just in one area uh, you won't make a living <laughs> okay you uh, unless you are working for a particular organization or uh, institution or government institution or or company or whatever where they only deal with legal stuff or financial stuff then you specialize in that and you're fine and you have a a permanent job and you're okay otherwise Uh, with experience with time you find yourself working in different areas and you yourself will realize that you are much more comfortable in certain areas rather than others for example i know a lot of colleagues who are not comfortable with medical uh, medical events medical events uh, have this reputation of being very difficult it depends i don't find them difficult uh people find legal events very difficult i did a, for four or five years in the legal field and i've gotten used to a lot of terminology a lot of context i've worked with judges from different countries uh both uh, international and local and therefore i've developed that broad context that allows me to work comfortably in the legal field uh, uh but again in the financial field is very difficult too you have to have a lot of terminology a lot of background so uh, I, i i do some work there but i'm still struggling with it okay uh, I'm, i'm okay it's all relative so yeah specializing in one area if you can afford to do that that would be best but uh, real life is not like that okay <laughs> uh, excellent so uh, yusra غربي اند ليزا سايد ليلى ليلى هذه ليلى زميلتنا يس ليلى نيجرو سي 
Yes. <laughs> Ahla sahla. I, I thought it was you. <laughs> yes. So yes, please. Uh, Yusra Gharbi and then Lisa Saidi. Uh, yeah. Hi, hi, doc- Doctor uh, Mohammed. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, I know that you talked about this uh, earlier, uh, but I want to ask you: uh, Do you think that the absence of uh, visual uh, input affect the interpreter's uh, output? Mm-hmm. And if so, what one can do to prevent that? Excellent. That's so let's take uh, yeah. Lisa, uh, Lisa Saidi, and then Yusr Salhi, and then we Salah Khalifi. As yeah, and Taqwa Jandubi. Please, Lisa Saidi. Hello again. Um, so um, for my first question, I want to know um, your thoughts about interpreting only to your mother tongue language. As for, uh, for example, uh, European Union interpreters, their advice is to interpret only to the, the mother tongue language. Mm. So okay. I want to know your thoughts. And my second question is a bit out of the theme of this encounter. Shall I? Go ahead, please. Ask the question. This is an okay, informal exchange, you. so <laughs> nothing is irrelevant. <laughs> thank you so much. So I want to know how to manage the different accents in English and ah. more specifically the, the most difficult one like uh, the Scottish, for example, which is extremely pleasing uh, in fact, but uh, still an issue for me. Yeah, you haven't heard uh, Japanese English and Cameroonian English and Nigerian <laughs> English, have you? And, and Indian English. Well, it's it's and very Indian, well, Indian yeah. yes. So Lisa, yeah. where, where are you from? Are you from Algeria? Algeria, yes. Algeria. Yes, welcome. Yeah, okay, okay, Yusr Salhi. So uh, I wanted to ask, like, what do you think are the challenges for someone who is not or did not um, major in translation, uh, such as myself? Like, what are the challenges and how does someone uh, like that uh, enters the field? What is your major? Uh, cross-cultural studies. So I'm an English major. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wissala Khalifi. Uh, thank you so much for your priceless uh, insight, doctor. Okay, so uh, the interpreter starts with back, which is composed of note-taking, short-term memory, contextualization, and developing one's pragmatic competence, as emphasized. There is also anticipation in simultaneous interpreting. Mm-hmm. So how to develop or acquire this skill or does it come naturally with practice because as you know once this skill is acquired it makes the task way easier for interpreters and relieves the brain from uh, the uh, cognitive load by you know anything right. good okay. that's good okay so actually i am soliciting an advice rather than asking a question if i may okay, okay. Mm, go ahead please. Uh, Everybody is doing the same. (laughs) It's all advice here. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So uh, while translating, I've been confronted with uh, some terms that have more than one equivalence. Mm -hmm. But we've been taught that uh, you can choose the right equivalent according to the context. But what Uh we do when we have uh, a term that has its equivalent uh, that has more than an equivalent in the, in the, in the same context. May I give an example? Because of, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In Arabic, in Arabic, say may? Mm-hmm. Go ahead, yes. Okay. So, Tadafar Jamia al Juhud al Rasmiya wal Ahliya wal Dualiya. When you translate Rasmiya, uh, you can say official or also you can say um, governmental government bodies. Mm. And the same goes for the ahliya, which can be also in use. So, which which one is more correct in this context? And thank you. So, rasmiya, ahliya, and what's the other word? Uh, rasmiya and ahliya. So, uh, oh, rasmiya. Just two. One. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a cultural difference. Okay. <laughs> yes. Shayma uh, Gizani. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hi. The uh, question is: Besides the academic acquisitions, where from can we acquire linguistics and pragmatics skills outside of school? 
Thank you. Mm-hmm. And last but not least, Shiraz Manai. Go ahead, please. Hello again. So uh, my question is how not to be uh, amnesiac as we all are, <laughs> this beautiful generation. <laughs> we do forget anything we learn. It's a really big problem for me personally. So is there any advice for me? And thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> to you, Professor Deut. Thank you very much. That's a good, a good bunch of questions. Uh, the first one was about visual input. Is it helpful? Obviously, yes, absolutely. Visual input is very helpful. Uh, sometimes uh, we interpret in uh, financial events or, or, or even political events where they, pre- where they present a lot of data, a lot of numbers, a lot of uh, uh, di- uh, graphs and, and charts and things like that. Um, oftentimes they give us copies of those things, so it's always good to have them beforehand so we can look at them and prepare. Uh, it also happens that they don't give you anything. And then they show things on a screen, and the screen is so far away from you that you can't even see what's on it. Or it's so packed with information. The screen is so loaded with information in small print that you can't read it. Okay? So let me tell you that a lot of presenters in these different events where you will be interpreting do not know much about communication. Okay? They happen to be... uh, a minister or a CEO or a judge or whatever, but their communication skills and their presentation skills are not always to your liking. So expect anything. Uh, When the visual information is there, it's extremely helpful, especially when it involves statistics, numbers, and things like that. Uh, Very helpful. If, if, If it's not available, it's really uh, tough because they would be churning out, they will be listing, they will be speaking numbers, 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 and it's very hard to follow what they are saying, and that's very hard to translate. And a lot of us uh, just wing it. You know what wing it means in English? We do what we can, okay? (laughs) If they don't give you the information, and if the information is not clear, What can you do? They list a number, they zip through and they go through to the next sentence or the next number. What what can you do? What I do for that is I keep a piece of paper in front of me and a pen like this. And every time they say a number while I'm translating, I write it down. Okay? So that helps me keep up with the pace. And I'm pretty good with that, honestly. I, I I can handle the numbers pretty well. I've had colleagues in my booth that, that are really not. <laughs> and we, we people uh, from English departments are generally what we call literary people, not science people, okay? And therefore, we're afraid of numbers. We have this, this, um, this uh, what do you call it? I forgot the word, see? <laughs> okay, we're phobia. afraid of... Not- phobia. Phobia, yeah. Some of us have phobia. And, and therefore, uh, I, I've seen people just say the same figure. Whatever the other figures they are saying, they just keep repeating the same thing. So I don't know. Anyway, um, so, yeah, when, when you have numbers and specific details, you need to have the visual input. Otherwise, you're, you're, you'll suffer. Okay, interpreting to mother tongue. Uh, it's obviously better because obviously your mother tongue, you're much better at your mother tongue, although for Arabic speakers, what is your mother tongue? That's an issue, okay? And our control of fusha, of uh, uh, modern standard Arabic or literary Arabic or legal Arabic or financial Arabic or whatever is, is, is always a question mark to me. So some are better than others. Some are... Uh, even uh, don't take your mother tongue and an Arabic speaker don't take your mother tongue for granted okay because um, you will be translating to Fusha not to Derja and translating to Derja to Ammiya is really difficult okay Uh, it's really another area another skill altogether Uh, your mind cannot get around it Uh, I've done it a few times uh, uh, but it's, it's another process altogether it happens in the mind uh, I am a linguist, I'm a, I've studied neuro-linguistics, and so I'm still surprised by the kinds of things that happen in my mind when I'm translating. Amazing. Okay, 
Subhanallah, I say. That's all. <laughs> different accents. How do you deal with different accents? You get used to them. That's all. <laughs> if they've given you material to prepare, you're, you're okay. But still, when there is a discussion or when someone is presenting and, uh, and they have a really uh, strong accent, um, it's, it's very difficult. So you have to, um, sometimes uh, hopefully your colleague sitting next to you will be better. So you let them do it. <laughs> okay, until you get the hang of it. But usually in the first half hour, hour, hour and a half, you get the hang of it. By the end of the day, you're fine. All right? <laughs> That's about accents. Challenges for non-translation majors. Most of us are non-translation majors. I didn't tra study translation. A lot of my colleagues translating never studied translation. Uh, so, uh, hello, Muhammad. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so uh, he is a translation major. <laughs> but uh, so it's not it's not uh, forbidden for you to get into it. Like I said, some people are very good at translation, but when they go in the booth, they can't do it, okay? It's almost a, a, a God-given gift. It's a, it's a, it's a, some people uh, can put up with the pressure and the pace of speech, and they, can, they have enough flexibility and enough background knowledge to handle what's going on in the booth and actually come out with something that makes sense on the other side. Uh, others who may have translation training will have some of the techniques, uh, they will have some of the terminology, but again, it always depends on the event, on how much, pre how prepared you are, how well prepared you are, and, uh, and how much of a risk taker you are. If you are in the booth, I think you should take a lot of risks. I mean, you don't want to translate wrong, obviously, but you have to have faith in yourself and, and keep going and you'll get better as you, as you do it. Okay, uh, cross-cultural. I forgot what the question was. Um, uh, there was somebody that said, said, maybe they can repeat the question. Anticipation. I like that question very much. And I, I want to make a distinction here between skill and strategy. A skill is something you do automatically, like walking, right? That's a skill. Reading, we call it a skill. Writing, we call it a skill. Okay, that's something you develop over, over time and you, deal, you, 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 you get along with that. Uh, strategy is something you use when you are in a bind. When you, have a, when you face a problem, you have a, a difficulty, you have to overcome an obstacle, you use a strategy, okay? And one of the uh, strategies that I consider very helpful is anticipation. Again, anticipation takes us back to what we said about context and background knowledge and how prepared you are for the event. And oftentimes, I find myself going ahead of the speaker. I know what they're going to say. And sometimes I say it before them. It happens a few times, not always. It actually happens a few times, not, not, not very often even, not even sometimes, less than that. But, but anticipation is, it shows that you are in line with the, with the speaker that you have that your background knowledge is really there it's instantiated it's helping you and you you're you're cruising then you're it's it's delightful feeling to be like that to be translating in that situation when you can actually you feel you are one with the speaker and that's what i said earlier that that's where you get to a point where they they forget you're there and you forget you're translating okay it, it goes so smoothly between one interlocutor and the other in the meeting room and you're over there in the booth just transmitting messages between them. And they, they actually happen to, to communicate so smoothly, so naturally that, that it's almost going on without interpreting at all. Okay? Thank you. It happens. Yeah, let, me, let me go on with a few different terms with different meanings or, or equivalents. Uh, terms uh, like Rasmiya, Ahliya. Again, in Tunisia we say Rasmiya. I think in Egypt they say Ahliya, huh? right? Or in some other, some other countries. Muhammad will correct me. Okay, so again, uh, it's like what I said earlier about Wakil al Jumhuriya, or Nayb al Am, or Mudda al Am, or Kada. Different countries, different institutions have their different jargon which they use. And all you have to do is learn that, get used to that, okay? Uh, for instance, uh, 
I will be translating to um, Moroccans. احنا نقول الإدارة إدارة المشاريع ولا إدارة كذا وهم يقولوا تدبير. Okay? There's no other way to do that. You just have to learn it. تدبير ال Huh? Okay? What else? Uh, how do you learn? Do you learn linguistic and pragmatic skills outside school? Mostly outside school, not in school. <laughs> school is very limiting in terms of, uh, as far as I'm concerned. You only spend a few hours with, in class with a teacher. Most of our language learning doesn't happen in school. It happens outside the classroom. Okay? The more you read, the more you expose yourself to the language in spoken or written form, if you travel to the other country, if you learn about other cultures, if you learn about other disciplines as cultures, okay, then the better off you will be. Uh, how not to be an amnesiac and forget what you learned? Well, <laughs> one, of the, one of the good things about interpreting is it keeps your, uh, your, um, your mind working. It's a good, uh, a good uh, preventive of uh, uh, Alzheimer. <laughs> right? It keeps your mind working all the time and it keeps reminding you, you forget things, we all forget things. So uh, you keep reading, you keep uh, preparing yourself as much as you can and hope for the best. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take uh, three more questions before right. the wrap up because I'm worried okay. about time. It's almost uh, 12 past nine and we need to be finishing very soon. Uh, first, I give the floor to Dr. Haneshi and then Asia Bahri and finally Afef Bujama. Yeah, Dr. Leila, 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 Leila is, uh, uh, I cannot raise, see her hand. Uh, perhaps. Her hand. Yes. Uh, Mohammed yes, also wants to ask a question. Okay, so uh, Dr. <laughs> Haneshi, then Leila, and then Mr. Mohammed. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Hi, uh, Professor Dawood. Hi. How are you doing? Do you hear me? We do. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So I actually have two questions uh, for Professor Dawood. So the first one um, what if we get emotionally involved in a meeting <laughs> and in order to ease tension between interlocutors, um, do we need really to hedge or slightly change the, the message? I mean, for negotiations to go on. That's a good one. Um, the second one is, if we interpret for a specific person, do we have to study, I mean, their style, in terms of agency or whatever, um, I mean, suppose you're, you're translating or you're interpreting for Trump or people who don't know English and the way he speaks, I mean, this arrogance. And, I mean, thank you. All right. Thank you. I hope I understood the second question, but yeah. Dr. Okay. Leila Lakhwa, please, you have the floor. Can me? Yes, Can we do. Me? We do. Yeah. Yes. Hi, good. everybody. It's so Hi. good oh. to meet all of you again. Yeah. It's <laughs> to <great. e> meet you. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, uh, just um, a question to Muhammad. Uh, yeah. You said, what is language? And I know that language, any language has two levels, competence and performance. We all know this. And I think tra desk translation has more to do with competence, whereas interpretation has more to do with performance. I think... Uh, what's your comment on this, Muhammad? And my second comment about the question who, uh, my friend who said, that what should come first, translation or interpretation? I think written translation helps a lot. I think someone with absolutely no experience in translation and who would jump inside the booth will have a lot of difficulties. And Muhammad, you insisted on the fact of uh, knowing about the context, about the terminology. I think written translation helps a lot in that. Mm -hmm. And my own experience, um, like you, I started with written translation and then I shifted to interpreting. And I found that my experience in written translation helped me a lot. Thank you. Mm. Say Muhammad Masuri. <laughs> Professor Masuri, go ahead, please. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. It's hello. really a pleasure to, uh, you know, follow part of this uh, presentation, and uh, and I would like to be able to 
interact a little bit. There are uh, four items actually that I um, heard from those who asked questions or made comments, mm -hmm. which I'd like just to expound on a little bit. There's one on, uh, you know, memory with, uh, with, with figures and things like that. You know, this always remains difficult. But let's just uh, emphasize here the fact that you have two people in the booth, at least. Mm. And if you have someone next to you who is alert enough and can write down for you some of the figures, as some speakers tend to zoom through their papers, sometimes because of time constraints or things like that, or because they are not used, as uh, uh, Professor Dawood said, to you know, communication and things like that. So let's always remember that you have a team and that your teammate can always help you, not only with, with, with figures, but also with certain terms that they happen to know and that you may stumble on. The other thing is related to amnesia. Some people uh, have advised that you just, uh, you know, tune to a program, TV program or a radio program and allow the speaker to start. And then after one minute, you take off after him or her. Then you make it, uh, if you like, a three minute uh, distance between you and him or her. And then a four minute distance, well, it's actually in seconds, not in minutes. But then it, it all, this is an exercise that really helps you retain, you know, things in your mind if you're, you're, if you're trying to follow a speaker, let alone improve certain people's pronunciation when they have, you know, uh, problems of uh, pronunciation. Now the issue of equivalence. A question was raised about equivalence. Of course, you have the dictionary definition. But you have a contextual meaning. And it is important also to consider that the equivalent is not just a lexical one. The equivalent can be quite dynamic and functional and things like that. I mentioned earlier on today an example of someone who said, I better be tried by 12 than carried by six. You know, the interpreter, the interpreter didn't seek what I would call a mechanical or automatic equivalent, mm. he sort of indigenized the expression in the local context and said, let his mother cry, then mine, something like this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on uh, preparation, of course, preparation, as, as uh, Professor Dowd said, you have different terms in, in, in different countries, sometimes even neighboring countries, like al Mistara in, in, in Morocco or Mudawanat al Usra. Uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in Algeria, I guess. Uh, but preparation also involves tuning to uh, uh, a local television. You know, when uh, there was a time when there was a lot of translation being done for Libya, for instance, and now there's a lot of translation being done for Yemen, it is good to get tuned from time to time to the Yemeni television, right. or to the Libyan television, or to the Algerian television, then you take some half hour, and then you learn a lot from this. This is just by way of complementing what Professor Daud has aptly uh, expounded on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mansouri, for the input. Uh, we have Afef Boujema, uh, and then we finish with Umayma bin Tuhemi. Afef, you have the floor. Thank you for giving me the floor again. So my question is um, in the form of a comment. It's about exposure to a language, to learn that language and to learn about the culture. Is it enough to, to be exposed to the language only by listening to this language from the news or from music you said? And Our so on. Rakes, so can, I think can you, it's not enough. Can you say it again, Afif? You should live. No. Uh, I can hear. It's oh, okay. you can hear. Okay, good. Okay, got so the point. I said because I think, I personally mm. think that um, listening is not enough, and you should live in this in a country that speaks that language, uh, to understand culture better and to learn the language uh, better because there are some aspects of the culture that you you cannot understand uh, only by mm. listening mm. to uh, mm. to mm. news or mm. movies or music. Thank you. 
Of course. Certainly. I agree. And finally, okay. Naima bin Tuhami. Finally, yes. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you are interpreting a medical event, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested uh, in this field uh, as mm -hmm. that I can't pass without asking. Okay. So uh, can I? Uh, uh, can you please tell me more about about it? Uh, okay. Do you have to prepare always before the conference? Sure. And uh, what did you do to get acquainted with this field? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Over to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Let me go back to the beginning. Yeah, uh, I'd last about emotional involvement. I would, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Sometimes you, you find yourself in a sensitive situation. Um, a representative of a government says something that could be quite offensive to the other guy listening. What would you do? Translate it as it is or not, okay? Sometimes, uh, um, uh, I remember uh, <laughs> translating uh, from a Tunisian official to an American official, and it's clear that the Tunisian official had no sense of American culture and what, what is considered polite, impolite, uh, proper, not improper, and so on. So when I find myself in situations like that where I can actually smooth the message without creating a problem, I allow myself to do it without changing the meaning. Okay? Mm -hmm. If the comment is too the harsh, I may, I may make it milder, for example. If, if the situation calls for you to be direct and honest and let them fight it out. Avoid FTA. You mean. But if, if yeah. you are going to avoid without a cost to you, because sometimes, when you're interpreting in situations like that, there are other people listening and they understand both languages. Okay? Yeah. So they will hold you accountable. They will either say, you didn't translate what he said, or they will, uh, they will, they will accuse you of something. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful. Uh, there are very sensitive situations like that where if you can smooth out the argument without creating a problem, and you are the judge of that in that context. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're out of luck, really. <laughs> you just say that's what he said. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Um, but, but usually you're not alone in the room. There are other people in the attendance, and they understand both languages, and they can, they can, they can appreciate what's happening uh, between the two of those two people. All right? Mm -hmm. And there will be people on both sides comment. anyway. Huh? Uh, Mr. Salhe, I want to do a comment about it. May I? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I was please go ahead. Okay. Please. Man. I was in yes. a conference uh -huh. and two Africans insulted uh, each other. Uh -huh. I, I have translated in a mild way, uh -huh. but I had a reproach after this. They there said, why didn't you translate the, the insult? I could answer it. I uh -huh. see. There you go. See? Yeah. Sometimes they let you go, sometimes they catch you. So, <laughs> so you don't have much choice. Okay? If you, are, if you are translating to a specific person with a specific style, somebody who is, like you said, arrogant or excited, or, or sometimes you get somebody like, like uh, uh, President Trump who speaks about things that he doesn't know anything about, and he speaks like as if he were an expert. Well, what do you do when he translates? <laughs> Translating for someone like that. Do you remember the picture of the interpreter that was sitting next to him when he, did, he said something funny? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Those are difficult situations. Um, but uh, my, my, like I said for the first, uh, for the first answer, my, I, I, I guess personally I am a good um, reader of the people around in that situation. And I look at the people with the other person and the people with this other person and, uh, and I'm in that context and I usually make a call there and I take a risk. If I can smooth it out, I will. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I will just blurt it out as it is and let them handle it and say that's what he said. Okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank competence you versus tonight. performance. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I don't want to... This is an old issue, competence versus performance. I think whether you are translating or interpreting, you are performing.
Because competence, the definition of competence is this ideal knowledge that is only complete in the community. But let's talk about it not in terms of the linguistic jargon that we learned earlier and early on in our introduction to linguistics courses, but in terms of translating in a particular context, in a particular culture, in a particular discipline. Okay? You are not dealing with competence there. You are performing. And obviously you are performing based on your ability, based on what you know, based on how much background knowledge you have, how much experience you have with that language, with that culture, with those people, with that discipline. So you are performing and you are going by the seat of your pants. You are just basically improvising all the time as much as you can. Approximate the, uh, the meaning intended, okay? A translation versus interpretation. I think they are two different processes. When I sit down and I translate uh, in writing and I'm translating a document, that's one thing. And that's why I brought up the example uh, of colleagues who are excellent translators but really could not do any interpreting in the, in the booth. Okay? It's, it's just a different process. Two different processes. They go much faster. When you're translating, you have time to go to a dictionary. You check, you recheck, you can rewrite, you can review, you can edit, you can do all kinds of things. But when you are interpreting, it's on the spot. And oftentimes, speakers give you time to even think. Okay? It happens so quickly, and you have to keep with the pace. So it's, it's a totally different process. And therefore, yes, if you have translation, background certainly helps you I, I'm not saying it doesn't but uh, there are people with a translation background who couldn't do interpreting so there's something else there that we need to talk about much more okay uh, I agree with the, the suggestions of Muhammad about figures and amnesia I hope you get colleagues in your booth who can help you who don't disappear as soon as their half hour is over <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> Equivalence is also uh, a matter of uh, culture. When I say culture, I mean, please understand me, I mean it in the broad sense, not the traditional culture that we talk about, like uh, Indian culture or Tunisian culture. And I'm not talking about that culture. I'm talking about the culture of a discipline. Medicine is a culture. Lawyering is a culture. Uh, working in a financial institution, banking, for example, is a culture. The culture meaning that these people have their own norms of communication, their own documents, their own terminology, their own way of speaking, their own way of reading, their own way of communicating. That's what I mean by culture. And the more you, f you get close to that, the closer you get to that in terms of educating yourself about it and exposing yourself to it, the better you will be as an interpreter. See? Because you will be in their shoes, as it were. Sometimes when they like our, our interpreting, they come and say, if our judges, they say, are you a judge? Did you study law or something? They say that. And that's really the, most, the best compliment you get when they come and, 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 and start doubting whether you are actually a specialist in their field. It shows that you are in tune with them and, you are, and that's how you can also anticipate what they're going to say, which is what we discussed earlier. Uh, somebody asked about exposure. Listening, obviously, is not enough. I said exposure, meaning if you are preparing for an event, go to the website, read about it, find other readings about the event, educate yourself as much as possible. Listening by itself will not do it, okay? Because you will be speaking yourself. And, and uh, read, listen, uh, talk to people, whatever you can. Whatever you can do, all that is exposure. I don't mean by exposure, just listening. Okay, medical event. Somebody asked me, how do you prepare for a medical event? I'll give you a concrete example. One time, I knew the event was about uh, uh, surgical surgery of the eye. So they remove the uh, parts of the eye and they replace them with other parts and they do all kinds of very nitty-gritty things and it's all under a microscope. Well... I had to study the anatomy of the eye. My daughter happens to be a, a, a medical student at the time, so I, I sat down with her the night before, and I went through the anatomy of the eye. We just got the pictures, and I learned to name every part of the eye, the macula and the iris and all the other stuff. Okay? So when I went to that event, I was comfortable with the terminology. But beyond that, when they were presenting, they had video, they had uh, very little, uh, very few words on the, on the screen. Medical, 
medical specialists are, are good communicators in general. So they, they have very good, well-prepared presentations. They give them to you ahead of time, so you have time to prepare. So for that particular medical event, I did my homework at home. I studied the anatomy of the eye, and I learned as much as possible about surgery of the eye before I went there. Okay? I did another event on, uh, on uh, drugs for uh, cardiovascular disease with Novartis. It was very interesting because they got into medications and how much you prescribe of this and of that and three of this and three of that three times a day. Very technical and they get into a discussion which is very heated and very fast. And if you're not prepared for that kind of thing, you can't keep up. I, I happen to like medicine personally, so I read about it a lot. I have my own books at home. If my, one of my kids has a problem, I read about it and I go to the doctor, I already know what, I, what to ask. So again, it depends on how interested you are. You could be interested in finance or in fashion or in football, and therefore you, you go there and you do better than in other areas. So it's better to, do, to, to prepare yourself as much as you can. I think I'm done with the questions. I may have forgotten one, but those are the questions I took down. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor okay. David, for the input, for the answers. Um, if I may summarize very briefly the main elements and points you have covered, um, we have covered in this discussion with inputs coming from various uh, speakers and, and professors. Some uh, of uh, the uh, participants here have an academic background, some of the others have a professional background, some uh, of the others, they are novice in both, uh, and they are uh, students. Um, so the discussion covered uh, issues related to first uh, visual aids and uh, and whether they are helpful or not uh, the tone as part of the context the contextual cues the specialization in which area you need to specialize and whether it is good for a novice interpreter to take just few areas uh, to work in or to broaden the spectrum uh, of, of areas or to dig deep into one particular area and uh, get uh, some experience over there. Uh, we also discussed challenges. Uh, some of the challenges related to inferences, to interpretation, related to speed, uh, related to technical issues in both sides technical in the sense of terminology, like medical, you have mentioned, uh, but also uh, technical issues related to sound system. Sometimes when you um, stop receiving the uh, sound, then you cannot uh, offer any uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, there are other issues discussed uh, this evening related to the translation into the mother tongue. And the question, the big question about what is a mother tongue, whether it is the uh, dialect or the standard, like uh, uh, in Arabic, the st standard Arabic. So, uh, and whether you can do uh, 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 interpreting into a, a dialectal, uh, dialectal level. Uh, there is another question that has been raised related to the difference between skill and the strategy. So, uh, and how to employ both a skill and, and a strategy. Um, other questions related to negotiation, to style. Some other questions related to translation and interpreting. And uh, perhaps in the literature, uh, the term that is used more to uh, denote uh, the act of interpreting interpretation or is interpreting and interpretation is rather uh, at the wheel interpreting here tarjam al fawriya but interpreting is uh, can be uh, only carried out with interpretation and you cannot do uh, uh, proper interpretation without contextual cues um, contextual cues we are without you uh, as an interpreter, uh, going uh, and 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 seek uh, uh, seek information uh, from the context, 
so in this sense, the interpreter is a researcher. The interpreter also is an actor, sometimes mimicking, uh, mimicking the tone of the original speaker. Uh, and and the, the big question, what should come first, translation or interpretation? And we have heard also another input from uh, Dr. Leila Lahwa. Uh, there is another question raised about memory and how uh, you enhance memory performance. Uh, because after, after all, interpreting is uh, very complex in the sense that you are going to make your uh, brain and mind busy with three tasks. Listening, active listening, processing the information, and in relation uh, in relationship with, with the memory, and then the output, the performance. So perhaps here is uh, uh, the best context to employ and to use the, 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 the term um, performance rather than the classical uh, uh, dichotomy uh, between competence and uh, performance. Uh, and how to work as a team also uh, as a, in a booth uh, in a booth uh, both uh, booth mates can help one another uh, with figures for example um, especially in very technical and uh, uh, technical stuff especially financial stuff in this sense and we ended up um, or there is another question related to equivalence equivalence there are some um, researchers now they really they are hesitant to use equivalence, the term equivalence, but uh, rather they say interpretation. One of the speakers, uh, one of the guest speakers, uh, will be addressing this particular issue. Um, he told me I would rather put translation as interpretation rather than equivalence in translation, and he would be speaking. He will be uh, speaking by taking a case study. Uh, from the translation of the of the Bible, um, there are other uh, issues related to cultures, and Professor Dowd meant by cultures the norms, the jargons uh, of particular communities, the community of medical doctors, for example, the community of uh, lawyers, judges, and so on and so forth, and ended up with a very uh, nice note related to interest and passion. So you cannot. Excel, you cannot do your job properly if you miss uh, interest and you don't have uh, enough passion for what you are uh, doing, uh, and right. especially and in the area. If you allow me to say something on that, please go passion ahead. Passion is, is extremely important. I know people go to, into interpreting for money, there's quite a bit of money to be made there, but look, if you're not excited about this area, don't go in for the money. Go in for the excitement and you'll do very well. You'll have Take it as a hobby. <laughs> Take it as a hobby before Enjoy it. taking Enjoy it. it, yes, as a job. Yeah. yeah. But it is a rewarding job and a rewarding hobby as well. With this note, we come to the end of this encounter. Encounter at the shores of translation. Uh, we still have many more encounters tomorrow and after tomorrow and the days to come. I would like to invite you all to be there. Tomorrow we are going to have another one at uh, 11 a.m. with, uh, let me see the uh, schedule and the agenda. We'll be having Andrew Morris He's a professional translator, will be speaking from uh, Spain uh, on the road to, the, uh, to 6S, how to make it as a freelancer. Uh, I wish you good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Deod, for accepting our uh, invitation and uh, talking to us. I uh, would like to mention... Uh, some of the uh, professors who have taken part in this discussion uh, Dr. Leila Lahwa, Dr. Aida Sadiq, Dr. Hussein Bin Lazraq, and Professor Mohammed Al Mansouri, and also uh, Magda 
the uh, from Egypt. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking part in this uh, informal but very informative discussion. Uh, good night, uh, everyone. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.